We're here at the Croix, and we're here with Dimitri Daskalakis, who's the, the commissioner of the Bureau of AIDS in New York City. And we have him here to talk today a little bit about transgender issues and some of the, the challenges and the important issues around this, uh, this group of, of folks. We tried to get a number of other people, but for many reasons they didn't, weren't able to appear. So you're going to be helpful in trying to, uh, to express some of the, those concerns, at least from the point of New York City. Yeah, no, I'd love to try to place. channel yeah. that the yeah. best I yeah. can. Yeah. Great. So um, the Croy had, uh, it was the first time it really had a, a, a pretty good showing in presentations for this. And uh, it wasn't something that, uh, it certainly was something we should have done years gone by. And I've tried to do it, and the same issues go up. Uh, I guess maybe they're not invited or they weren't, you know, permitted to come or whatever, but here we are, so we're, we're good. Uh, but what are the challenges that, that some of the, uh, the transgender folks face? And it's probably around prevention, it's probably around treatment, it's probably around, around all of it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there's lots of different um, issues that, that are specifically a challenge when, when you're looking at the trans or gender nonconforming community. And I think that they, they sort of divide themselves in a couple of different ways. And one of them, from my perspective at the Department of Health, is measurement. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, identifying sort of the right way to measure the population and really sort of say who's trans and, and, and who's not, mm -hmm. in effect, is really critical because mm -hmm. measuring that population lets you really understand what the trends are. So, I mean, we know that HIV is, is a significant issue in that population. Population. And so we talk about trans women. <clears throat> New York City has been measuring um, the um, trends in trans, trans people for several years, mm -hmm. but it's limited by the data input. So I think that that mm -hmm. is one, one bucket of, of sort of challenge. But mm -hmm. the other, from the perspective of research, is I think um, creating research studies that are appealing to trans women and not having, and men, <clears throat> and having them actually be seen as people who are gender non-conforming mm -hmm. rather than either MSM or women who have sex with mm -hmm. men and sort of then put into this cluster. Mm -hmm. So I think so, it's challenging. Are, are, so do they, do they uh, speak up and say, wait a minute, I'm not male or female, I'm transgender female? Or do they identify themselves and... And or or is, yeah. it, is, the trial, is there no slot? So that I think is I think that yeah. that's what's changing, and I think you're mm -hmm. seeing that at Croy. So for you know having this like amazing main stage symposium at Croy, talking mm -hmm. or, or plenary session at Croy, talking about sort of the specific issues in mm -hmm. in HIV from the perspective of trans individuals, I think is is a watershed moment from the perspective mm -hmm. of, of large presence at in the HIV research mm -hmm. universe. I mean, I think that a lot of people have been have been. Um, working with trans populations. But I think that there's always this interesting question of how do you measure that population in a research study like mm -hmm. from the perspective of like what box do you check? And so right, I think right. that one of the things that's exciting about this is that it's okay to check a, a third box mm -hmm. that's not necessary, or a fourth one or a fifth one. Mm -hmm. So a box that's not necessarily a, a mm -hmm. gender binary box. Mm -hmm. so, so the question is though, I guess also, is that when things are not in the right order in your approaching a trial as a transgender person, uh, sh they should be aggressive. They should say, wait a minute, this oh, yeah. is not, this needs to be rethought because this is not, I, I'm not comfortable with this. Uh, I, I can't Agreed. imagine somebody in New York not uh, saying that yeah. because they're aggressive. Well, we, you know, but people, there are passive people. New Yorkers are loud, but then there's, you know, it's a, it's a broad spectrum. And I think so that really from the perspective of, you know, in anything, not only in research, but in, in mm -hmm. even care. In care. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that one of the one of the problems is how much of the responsibility belongs to the study subject or the patient, and mm -hmm. how much of it should be inherent in the system or the study. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that definitely having loud advocates pushing toward, you know, saying this is not right, like there's not inclusion in this, mm -hmm. or this isn't really addressing my my experience mm -hmm. is critical, but then I think that the need to have this be hardwired in what we do mm -hmm. as a question, so is this something that is trans and gender non-conforming appropriate? So I think that definitely the, the pendulum has swung in the direction that people are really looking at this issue. Like so much mm -hmm. um, sort of popular culture change has happened mm -hmm. where I think the trans folks are, are more visible in the general universe. And mm -hmm. though I think they have been visible in a lot of the HIV universe from the perspective of studies and, and care, I think it really is pushing the envelope even further and saying that there's a baseline, mm -hmm. you know, aspect of human rights that's critical in the trans voice 
and not gender nonconforming voice being mm -hmm. heard both in studies and in care. So, you know, I think you're right. I think that it's important for people to be, to have that efficacy, that self-efficacy to really say like, hey you, but I think that the folks who are planning stuff also need to be, mm -hmm. hey us. So we're talking to both the top down and the bottom, the people who are the community up. Yeah. So we have to, and, and there, there are those both actions that are, the top down is going to be hearing it this time because at the core it's been there. It's huge. So, right? so I mean, it's it's going to get out there, but uh, so that means uh, facilities, restroom facilities, and so forth, that clinics and so forth will have to be better cared about. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such. You know, there's so many subtle. I mean, you know, in New York City, we we recently released this. Um, this document that's called a City Health Information Bulletin mm -hmm. that's for uh, improving the experience of trans people in care. Mm -hmm. And so it's literally a document that people can use and get medical mm -hmm. credit for, for taking, uh, you know, for taking some time to look at it and do some questions. But this, this document really sort of focuses on some of the stuff that I think, frankly, for a lot of people living in the HIV universe is sort of 101. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, we know for yeah. the most part, I mean, knock on wood, knock on wood, we know for the most part, you should make sure that you know the pronoun that someone yeah. wants to be addressed by. Yeah. Um, I think that that's not necessarily what happens in general care out there. Yeah. Um, and so I think that even simple things like that, trying to sort of change policy sometime to mm -hmm. be able to get bathrooms that are not gender specific, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is, should mm -hmm. be on people's mm -hmm. agenda. But well, they, they yeah. already have like handicapped bathrooms. That would be a perfect bathroom yeah. because it's, it's an individual bathroom. Yeah. So that, in, that would maybe solve a lot of problems with the, it's a, a neutral bathroom, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but if a person, okay, so a person is uh, living with AIDS or they're, maybe they're just seeking care or health uh, issues at a, a clinic, and or prevention, whatever, and they find something that's not right or, or inappropriate, how do they address that? Should they address it to the administrator there politely and say this, I'm yeah. not comfortable with this? And then is there someone else, that, or is, and short of that not working, is there someone that they could contact? Would it have to be someone like yourself in the health department in their city? And would that person be, would that person be responsive? Maybe, maybe not, dependent upon whether it's on the coast or somewhere in the middle of the United States. Right. And, and if think, not, then where else do you go? So I, I guess think that answer is very contextual because I could mm -hmm. literally give you a list of how one would do that in New York. Mm -hmm. So I you know they could they could talk to the clinic administrator, they could talk to the sort of the, the ombuds folk at the, at the facility or the hospital or wherever they are. But then like, you know, within New York City, they could always contact Department of Health, that's easy. But then we also have a whole phalanx of people who are in the city who work on sort of the issues of human rights and trans is really high on their agenda. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, talking about places where you're feeling biased, mm -hmm. you know, I think we definitely have mechanisms. I mean, New York City, I know this is, not, this is silly to say, but it's, it's pretty much as easy as dialing 311 to say mm -hmm. what happened and they can direct you to the right spot mm -hmm. in New York. So mm -hmm. I think that definitely we have infrastructure right. to do that. And I also think there's energy around it. So mm -hmm. I feel like rather than sort of not pursuing care because the environment is mm -hmm. not appropriate, reach out because mm -hmm. there are people who can A, point you to environments that may be more appropriate for you and B, look at the environment where you had the issue to see mm -hmm. if they can make it better. Mm -hmm. And that I think is, you know, that, that goes across the board from medical to non-medical, research to care. I think the most important piece is that, you know, I think that the trans community um, is having sort of a, a, a very important social moment mm -hmm. where people are listening. So right. you have to make noise to be so, listened to. So this is the time to, to make do it. it. Do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. So um, the people that are in, like I said, getting back to the non-New York area, right. I, I know you can speak to that, but but the non-New York area is, is really going to be a challenge. And I think there may be national connections, or maybe they can just call New York and say, hey, I'm over here in Rochester, and I've got... Right. Well, I mean, I'm not, I don't work with a state, but you picked Rochester. State is great on this, too. Oh, the whole state, Their AIDS yeah. Institute is amazing in terms of, like, focusing on trans health. But, I mean, I, I generally have the same mechanism for approach in general for, like, LGBTQ mm -hmm. people, like, no matter what the story is. Like, if they're in a local environment where they're not finding the service they need, or they're not finding the... Um, the sort of places as sensitive to, to what their needs mm -hmm. are. I tend to say that the first thing to do is to go onto the internet, to Google the most local LGBTQ friendly community based organization and create a social connectivity to that 
for you. So mm-hmm. I mean, generally, there's someone somewhere in that environment who can either like look at what's going on locally or refer you to the right national person. So you know, mm-hmm. there could be national organizations. I mean, there definitely are national organizations mm-hmm. that target this. Right. And so hearing something in a local venue, they may be the right place to go. Mm-hmm. But I like to say, look at what you got around you. Mm-hmm. Ask your clinic if you're getting care. If that's where the problem is, see if there's a community-based organization or something that sort of focuses on LGBT issues. Ask them what's going on, and then if that doesn't work, elevate, elevate, elevate. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if, uh, I guess I imagine most people who are transgender gravitate towards cities that are going to be transgender friendly. And that's my guess. So I think but, that that's not, I mean, it's true. I think that if you were to look at the concentration of people of a trans or non-gender conforming experience, they probably do cluster in cities. Mm-hmm. There are definitely v- people who are in the rural universe or the suburban universe mm-hmm. who are trans or gender non-conforming who have the exact needs of the people mm-hmm. who are living in the city. Mm-hmm. So they get a pretty, I mean, the population is, and as you saw at the Croy panel, mm-hmm. like it's not small, it's mm-hmm. not giant, but it's, it's a real population, and Meaningful. I think it, it yeah. spreads throughout the, it's not just, you know, I, I'm sure, like I said, there's concentrations in urban centers of trans people and not gender non-conforming folk, but um, they're everywhere. I mean, when I, I came, I did a cross-country bicycle tour, and I ended up in a place in Kansas who I said, where is the, uh, the HIV section or health department? They said, we don't have any HIV. Right. I said, well, you have one now. They said, we get the hell out of here. <laughs> that's wild. So, so that's what I'm getting at. So, and you asked why they moved <laughs> that's to New York. The HIV, well, right? there's the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, sorry, exactly. I said if no, I, I was transgender, it, yeah. it would be yeah. But one people more. do. I mean, like it's amazing. Like the experience that people have. I mean, I think it's. I think that you know, trans people are everywhere, and mm-hmm. I think that this is like one of just like gay people are everywhere, mm-hmm. people living with HIV are everywhere. So, I think that your experience in Kansas represents the main problem, which is. That um, not to reference a bad old policy, but there's this don't ask, don't tell universe <laughs> yes. in every direction. So, like, you know, do we ask, you know, do docs in New York and providers in New York ask two stage questions for gender? Mm-hmm. N- not always, mm-hmm. some do. And then you figure out what pronouns are right. It makes everything great. But I mean, bottom line is if you're a gender non-conforming person who is going to a, a doc in, you know, I won't pick on Kansas. Let's pick on Idaho. We'll pick okay. another state. No, in, to Idaho, And you're not asked around this and you're sort of meek about it. Mm-hmm. You're not going to talk about it. But I mean, that's sort of what changes the story. Like if it's mm-hmm. just a matter of routine that every human that you meet you know, whether they're 15 or 80, you say sort of what is your preferred pronoun? You know, mm-hmm. like that's like the Fenway model. That's like mm-hmm. the, the Cal and Lord model. That's you walk in the door and no matter who you are, they just ask you this because it's just a matter of routine. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, you know, from the perspective of, you know, men who have sex with men, things are getting in the right direction mm-hmm. with people having that be a part of the story that you get that history because, you know, it's a major issue. And like, you know, so many things have elevated in the media that even like your dog who may not read any literature is aware that there that there's issues around MSM that need to be observed. Um, but that, I think, is the same with the trans moment. Like, this is the moment to say, you know, it should be a matter of routine that you say, mm-hmm. you know, you present to me as male, but I'm going to ask you, like, what is your preferred pronoun? Mm-hmm. Like, were yeah. you, what, is, what sex were you born? Male. Yeah. What gender are you? Female. Well, I know your pronoun. What would you like mm-hmm. to be called? Okay. So I feel like that is, you know, and, and that didn't feel weird, right? No. Yeah. But I is mean, it, the thing is. But see, I even think know. that some of the providers are hesitant to, to push that forward. So right. it's, it's always that, that uh, uncomfortableness on both sides. Right, I, mean, I, always, yeah. I always go back to like, if you're a trans person or an MSM or whatever your category is, if you're sort of asked this question, it's like a giant high five. You feel like someone is interested in the story. If you are com- like heterosexual, gender conforming, you're just kind of like, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's just not really that big a deal. So I think that that, I think, is a trick to sort of normalize it. Yeah, that, exactly. From the Department of Health perspective, that's one of our big strategies in New York City. And I think that throughout the country, I think CDC is similar. It's just like... It's just a matter of time, I guess. Talk so about it. Yeah. Just put it out there. In time, we will get get this, this integrated within the system. Yeah, and it just should be. Okay. Just like, do you smoke cigarettes? Yeah. No one's shy about asking that. Yeah, exactly. Plenty <laughs> stigmatizing, right? And there it is. Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Dimitri. Pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy Croy schedule to do this. My and, pleasure. And uh, we enjoyed the, uh, the conversation. Great. So thank nice you. meeting you. Thank All you. Right.